Hi everyone, it's Jessel here. Once again, um, in case you haven't heard the other message from the other podcast, because why would you have, I don't know. Uh, this is all kind of been pushed back a couple of months. So we recorded this in January. Uh, right now, because of Corona, there is plenty of time to do everything and also for you to listen to everything. So um, you might get a couple of references in the podcast that are seemingly a little bit out of date by a couple of months, but don't worry too much. Uh, anyway, the main thing is I hope that you are safe and healthy, that you're staying at home if you're in isolation, wherever you are in the world, because this is a global pandemic we are facing together. That's all from me. I hope that's not all from me. I mean, that sounds really morbid, but like, I, I, as in like, I hope there is more to come. Anyway, enjoy the podcast. Thank you. Peace. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Transatlantic Rebels podcast. On this episode, we are <laughs> we're going to... I made a joke in the pre, pre-session about Rashad just reading out his tweets. Uh, I, honestly, I've never seen anyone tweet about one subject as much as he has about something that he's repeatedly said he's going to stop tweeting about. I am talking about Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. However, I will caveat that. Right, that's not criticism, and also you've been tying it into all the other Star Wars films, which I have actually found really interesting. You've been like, there've been noted things that I no- that you noticed that I was like, oh yeah, and then it's like a callback to Episode One or Two or Four or this or that. So that's actually been really fascinating. But oh my god, it's been hilarious, and I, I reserve the right to slightly make fun of Rashad for going back on his word every hour on the hour. Give us more tweets, we'll give you the world. <laughs> oh my god, I just couldn't take so, the takes. Um, <laughs> it's just, I didn't want to do it. I kept looking at the takes and I'm getting more and more pissed off. Like, come on, guys. This is not complicated, guys. Come on. Film Twitter, you have gone to the sunken place. Honestly, you are in <laughs> such a dark place right now. With just not this film, not just this film, any film, any film right now. Oh, my God. If you ever are like a director or an actor, do not go on Twitter and click on the hashtag film Twitter. Just don't do it. Your film will be savaged by everyone about every frame of your film and you'll just just be destroyed just don't do it anyway um star wars the rise of skywalker um obviously this is going to be a very spoiler filled uh podcast it's now been out for a couple of weeks now i guess yeah it's gonna be like a week after this week yeah um i watched it on the not i didn't go to the midnight showing because i just wasn't really hyped enough to do that to be honest um and I think I did that for The Last Jedi. I think I watched Force Awakens and The Last Jedi in like a double bill. Um, this time I just wasn't that bothered. But it, it came out, uh, I still watched it within the first 24 hours. And interestingly, the cinema was only half full at the 8.30 showing, um, which I was shocked about. I was absolutely, I was like, yeah, this would definitely be sold out. And I could not believe it was half full at 8.30 on a Thursday evening. I mean, really bizarre. But that kind of played into what I was thinking because this is the least hyped I've been about a Star Wars film possibly ever. I mean, yeah, I get, I mean, yeah, I'd say probably ever. Um, maybe Revenge of the Sith, like people were not hyped, but it turned out to be such an amazing film that we loved. Um, but yeah, I mean, so what was your experience? When did you see it? Was it was it full of, you know, Star Wars fanatics and so on so on? I think with the moon that I go, I went, it was packed. I, did I, I don't think I, don't, I didn't go to we don't have midnight here we have um, I don't know how you guys work over there but we have like early showing sometimes at like 5 o'clock in the afternoon 6 o'clock in the afternoon it was a 5 o'clock in the afternoon I wasn't the biggest this this most people who follow me on Twitter are like shocked at my reaction to the the, the uh, Rise of Skywalker because I've been one of the biggest critics of the um, the Disney Star Wars movies since they came out um so I wasn't, I wasn't even, I wasn't even originally going to go see by the Skywalker. I was like, you know what? It's five o'clock. It's a cheap price. Let me just see it just for the hell of it. The end of the movie right there. That's how I was. I literally went there and saw it. So that was my, before going to it. The reason why I said I wasn't shocked when you were talking about how it, the theater was half empty, because I think this generation of Star Wars movies 
Um, I don't think anybody knows what they want from Star Wars right now. I think people who like The Force Awakens wanted one thing, and people who like The Last Jedi wanted one thing, and then this happened, and I think it didn't satisfy a lot of people on either camp and this and that. It's just been weird. It's, it's funny because people was like, The Mandalorian brought Star Wars fans together. I was like, motherfuckers, you guys are complaining about that one too, so what are you talking about? It's like, I don't know. But um, so I sat there and watched the movie, and I started picking up on certain things. And it took me a while to get it. I was like, because for the longest time watching these Star Wars movies, I'm like, why would these movies be considered part of the Skywalker saga? Like, it just seems like they should have been better off taking off of there. Just making their own things. Not have Luke, Han, and Leia and stuff in there. It's like, it makes no sense to bring these characters back. But then when I watched Skywalker saga, because I remember I watched, um, I, I was watching last, I was watching, um, Force Awakens, the last time I first see this one, I was like, let me just give him one more shot. And then as I watched it and I seen the end of the movie, I was like, okay, I get what these movies were now. It's not about, necessarily about, it's not trying to do what George did. It's about generation after, the generation who grew up on Star Wars, they're showing their appreciation for these characters and for what George Lucas did. And now they're carrying their own path. And Ray's journey is the journey that these two directors that kind of like had their films about what Star Wars should be, but still paying respects to the Skywalkers and Lucas and now they're going to their own path. And I was like, okay. And once I got that part, then I started appreciating the other two more. And then I kind of accepted them into the, the, the nine film Skywalker saga that way. But I don't, I don't think people saw it that way. I think people had their different ideals more along the story itself than anything else. So for me, when I saw it and I, and I got into it that way, that's when I kind of like, started like adoring the this treat this trilogy as something where it's like it's looking at how these characters affected us as moviegoers and filmmakers and now that we've shown appreciation for them and that we appreciated them inspiring us to be better people now we found our own way to move on with ourselves so that's the way i saw the movie and that's how i fell in love with it and it had it ranked so high on my list that it honored george lucas's first six movies by not trying to replace them but to appreciate them put them in their proper spot know that they will always be with us and then move on and I was like okay now I understand what these three movies were about so I appreciate it a little bit more if you've never listened to any of our Star Wars podcasts before um, we we really liked the prequels especially Revenge of the Sith um, we have done the Last Jedi podcast I don't know if we did a Force Awakens one I think that was just before we um, I think that was just before we started this podcast um, but the the last Jedi one was quite interesting. Uh, we will get to that later, without a doubt. But basically, I I mean, for me personally, Force Awakens, I thought it was a perfectly good reboot. It, but I mean, there's there's holes in it, fine. But I think it was really tightly made. Um, last Jedi, <sighs> I don't know. Like there there was there was a lot to admire in it. And there was a lot that was just, why is this even in here kind of thing? It just, you know, and, and I, I can, you know, there's, there's been really massive backlash against this film now and a huge, like, oh, there's a huge reappraisal. Ryan Johnson is a genius, blah, 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 to a nauseating degree, like nauseating. Because I, I don't know him. He's not my mate. Um, I haven't actually seen any of his other films. Like, oh, I haven't seen Knives Out yet. I, I love Knives, Knives Out. Out. Yeah. Thought, oh, God. So many, so many films to catch up on. Um and also, you said the Mandalorian. Yeah, we in the UK don't get Disney Plus until March. <laughs> that sucks. So, if anyone listened to the last podcast where I was complaining about things that we don't get in the UK for some reason now, like until three to six months after the US, Disney Plus is <laughs> just one of them. So everyone's like Mandalorian. I'm like, yeah, great, great meme. Don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I see this you. baby Yoda like what the hell's going on with baby Yoda yeah well I mean I could just about figure out something about baby Yoda but I'm trying to sort of avoid all spoilers and it's just ridiculous um, but okay and then it came to this I wasn't hyped but I think I think it, they did a perfectly good job I yes. enjoyed it and and like it was clearly wrapping up the whole thing it was clearly paying homage to a lot of different aspects of the whole kind of saga you know from one to eight and um and you know it was okay. A lot of it was fan service, fine. But you know what? Sometimes you got to service the fans. I mean, I won't make an argument about that. I won't make an argument about that. Oh god! The first two trilogies were known for calling back each other many times, even within the trilogies themselves. Literally, the Death Star came back a second time in its in the, in the original trilogy again. Literally, 
literally Luke and ha- Luke and Leia swung from the, the rafters in the first Star Wars movie episode, A New Hope, and then they swung again from Jabba's Jabba's cell barge. You know what I'm trying to say? It's it, it's weird because people say the fan service thing, and I get what you're, what they're trying to say, but and my I, I'll defend the movie in this sense where it's wrapping up nine movies. When you end something, you're going to have to call back certain things to wrap up all nine movies. So that movie not only had to be a movie itself, it had to wrap up the sequel trilogy and it had to wrap up all nine of them. And it's interesting because even though, even though the, the Holy Last Jedi, it literally it literally follows the structure of Empire Strikes Back. Literally, one person goes to train while the other group goes on these mis- misadventures. Literally. I'm like, so... I understand people talk about the fan service thing. You know what it is? It's for me personally. I mean, maybe you'll you have another thing to say. It's like it's almost like people want a certain type of fan service. They're saying fan service to be fan service, not the other fan service to be fan service. You know what I'm trying to say? It's weird sometimes. And it's also what what you said on Twitter and what I'd already kind of thought in my head or kind of started to formulate is that like liberal film Twitter, for want of a better word, kind of like is acting like right wing. F- like they on Twitter, like like the like the absolute crazy fanboys of Star Wars who are like, oh yeah, you know, you ruined our childhood, rah, rah, rah. The, you know, the, the sort of like film critic or film Twitter toward is like acting like that now about Star Wars, and it's like, oh my god, you're both doing the same thing, <laughs> yeah, you're just on different sides, and you're both as bad as each other now, and like we're just caught in the crossfire here, like yeah, that was a good film, it did yes. this, this, and this, and this, right, and we're just ducking like lightsabers and shit basically <laughs> from both sides and it's like come on man I know, said that- and, and that's what's really depressing and, and just or oh, well depressingly hilarious as yes. well like i have to say it's funny like i told people online i was like listen i was one of the biggest critics of the secret trilogy i was a big critic but even in my criticism of the secret trilogy i always always whenever whenever i went off to it like a like an analysis i would always say if you enjoy the last jedi and fourth of regular i'm happy that you enjoy that i never shit on somebody's taste going you know what that's not the real star wars that's how Star Wars work. I was like, I was like, these are the themes that work for me in the original six movies, and these things don't work for me in in the Last Jedi because the Last Jedi I had issues with Last Jedi thematically, but there was no point, in no time that I said that this wasn't the true Star Wars. I said I disagree with certain themes that it had that the other that contradicted the themes in the original movies, but I never said for million years that this movie's trash because it's not the real Star Wars. It's just not where it's gonna go, and people are literally calling out people's fan fandom. You're not a real Star Wars fan, blah, blah, blah. And Ryan Johnson changed the game forever. I'm like, did he really change the game forever? Like, did he really? Did he really? No. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no is my opinion. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're so right about the Empire Strikes Back thing. I mean, it's just literally, it's frame for frame at times, basically. Mm-hmm. And like, certainly narrative for narrative. I mean, he, he basically kind of updated it, made it really meta, changed yes. a lot of things in a lot of great ways. Um brought in some amazing imagery without yes. a doubt yeah some of the imagery from that film is astounding uh but i mean pff, otherwise it's basically empire strikes back yes like so, luke learns luke learns a lesson at the end and the other people learn to make learn that there's importance in making sacrifices han made sac- like Leia and han had to make sacrifice at the end of empire strikes back the rest of the crew had to make sacrifice but there's still hope at the end of the day. It's like the even the last shot. It's like there's still hope in the galaxy, even though they lost, or even though the bad guys were still out there. Like there was still hope. And if you, the first movie you introduced the characters, the second group, second movie you had the complication, and then the last movie you wrap it up. It's like what did you like? What do people expect that the rest, the rise of Skywalker was going to do? The good guys are going to win at the end. The whole entire point of Star Wars is that good overcomes evil. That's the point. Hustle, they said, here's the four used to get mad. And Lawrence Kans, then, who wrote the script for Return of the Jedi, used to get mad at George Lucas because, like, we want Hustle to die. And Lucas's predict was like, it's just as important that Luke saves his dad as the guy gets the girl at the end. That's the whole point of the Saturday morning serial. You get in the worst situation you get in and you get out. Those are the movies I grew up with. And sometimes I would, I, sometimes with liberal Star Wars Twitter, I want to say sometimes, like, these movies are based off the childhood of a white guy who grew up in Modesto, California in the 50s and 60s. That's his That's his childhood. And you want his vision of how the world is and what he grew up on to, to encapsulate everybody and everything. And I was like, but the end of this movie is pretty much showing you that, like, now that the Skywalker is behind us, we can all forge our own path and have our own identity. If you guys would just sit there and watch the movie, because people complain about, well, Ray is growing up. She, 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 they had her be nobody in the second movie, and now she's, now she's 
Now you find out he's the emperor's daughter, granddaughter. I'm like, but the movie's JJ is building on that theme of even if you come from somewhere, you don't have to be that. She rejected yeah, that. Exactly. I'm like, it's like, what are you guys talking about? He built on the theme. He literally built on it. Luke literally says, like, I'm like, guys, Luke literally says, some things are more than blood. The one thing you guys complained about, she rejected it. She took, there's a writer, it's funny, because there's a writer who's writing the novelization of Rise of Skywalker. And she said, the, the, these people are complaining about the Rise of Skywalker. She's like, she's like, you guys may be upset about this. She's like, but some people who were adopted and some people who didn't have a family that loved them or came from a negative family, like, that's something big to take the name of somebody else's family that showed you love, care, and compassion. That's a big thing. It's like, well, Ray should have had nobody's names. Like, no, she found she was she she grew up a scavenger trying to. It's, it's funny because she's scavenging. This is how I know JJ had the idea of having the emperor be her 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 grandfather. That was his plan originally because she was scavenging a a, a down that scar destroyer, and she was literally living in the ATAT. One of those one of those things that for guys you don't know the things the walkers that walk in the Empire Strikes Back. That thing. So she, her whole identity was she lived under the shadow of the empire, and her biggest fear in the first two movies was she didn't want to be evil. That's her thing that she was scared of, and she went through a journey that realized that she doesn't have to be that. She does because even the emperor says in the movie, he's like, "Well, Luke was saved by his father, but the only family you have is me." And she rejected her family. She rejected the name. She rejected that whole legacy because if you watch the movies, you look at the colors in the movies, where Luke and Anakin. Their colors get darker with each movie. Her color does not change at all. So she's the antithesis of, um, of um, the emperor. She's always been that way. She, she that that's the whole theme of that movie. Like she came from evil, but she never even felt that fight. Even when Kylo Ren put his hand out to her and offered it, she didn't have the struggles Luke or Anakin had for the dark side. She rejected it. She just feared that she she was so scared. That she thought she would fall into it, but her action, she never fell into it. And she finally realized that she never had to be that way at that point right there. Yep. And I, and I honestly, I don't <laughs> see what is so difficult to understand about the general thesis of what you just said. I don't, I don't get what's so difficult about it. Like, and, and, and why has liberal, and, and listen, we're both pretty liberal general yes. generally quite liberal guys or whatever we're certainly not like right-wing fascists or anything definitely not yeah we're certainly not the kind of people who are sending you know shit in the mail to ryan johnson for you ruined our childhood blah blah blah. i would say i would say we're healthily we're, we're reasonably progressive we're reasonably we're definitely progressive. definitely yeah. yes. without a doubt exactly. you know yeah um we're both feminists all yeah. that kind of stuff all the kind of stuff that the right hates basically with that yeah, yeah. but right now we're both <laughs> looking at this from the middle and we're like uh, how can you not be getting certain things like it, you're basically you know your your hate your hatred is blinding you right like both sides are just blinded right now by this shit and and what you're saying is absolutely true like say for example if 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 his name hadn't been palpatine yeah if he's not been like whatever the fuck his first name is tony or whatever palpatine right? <laughs> he's a tony palpatine <laughs> right like if it had been hitler like something really obvious or that's Mussolini, the point that's right? exactly yeah exactly right? so so if his granddaughter is going around rolling around being and she just she doesn't know yeah she's like fuck she's just learned <laughs> she's just learned on, on the show who do you think you are on bbc oh my god my grandfather was hitler yeah do you think she's gonna roll around if she's got the choice of being like oh yeah yeah my name is ray hitler of course she's not going to fucking do it. Why would she? If she's got like any common sense, she's not going to bring back that name. She's Everyone in the galaxy would hate her and automatically know, okay, yeah, the, all your anonymity is now gone, right? And, and also, she's just choosing a path for herself, which she's actively choosing and rejecting yes. the evil. Agency. Yeah, that has been... And, and also, the thing is, is that I think the, the thing that I really find mind-boggling is the amount of... I can understand identifying with a character, right? I can understand wanting certain things to happen, yeah. But we're also talking about someone who can shoot lightning from her <laughs> fingertips. <laughs> so there when are you're identifying with someone, there are, right? she's going on the hero's journey. She's supposed to be, she's supposed to, like, Luke, Anakin, and, 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 and Ray are supposed to be, when you watch those movies, anybody can fit into their shoes. They're walking the journey that every human being walked in life. They can't be one for one who you are. They can't be. They literally can't. They can't do that for you. Luke, George Lucas said something at one point. I always, I always put this on Twitter. He's like, George Lucas said, people want a psychological reality from Star Wars that they can't give them. 
I like that's not what Star Wars is built for. Star Wars is all the he said I saw all the myths of human history and these are all these are all the things that we I found common in all these myths and I'm gonna make this movie to put out there. Just Lucas had two goals, actually three goals. He won he wanted to make he wanted to make the Flash Gordon movie. He wanted to buy the rights of Flash Gordon and they didn't give him the rights. He's like you know what I'm gonna make my own Flash Gordon. The second one was he wanted to put all he wanted to take all the myths to inspire children to understand to. To, to at least have an, uh, to at least to think about the ideal of God or something spiritual out there. He's like, I think, I think young people should have an opinion whether they believe in God or not, whether they go for religion or spirituality or be atheists. He's like, I think young people should have an opinion on that. And then the third reason is, the third goal was, is to instill some kind of morality in kids to go, okay, these are the things that are important: family, friendship, and morals. And the other things that the dark side is greed, hate, and lust. Oh, I mean, not lust, but greed, hatred, and anger. Those are things you just shouldn't go for. Kind of like that. He's like, this is what I aim for. He even said in an interview on one of these Star Wars celebrations, he's like, they, they never wanted me to say this. My 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 my, my board of trustees was like, but these movies are made for 12-year-olds. Like, if you want to be an adult and come along for the ride, that's great. But I made these for the for 12-year-old because that's what 12-year-old, it, that's what I wanted for 12-year-old and me. That's what inspired me with these mythologies and Flash Gordon, this and that. And he was like, but you guys want it to be something that is not. And I think part of the problem nowadays, it goes with everything from politics to everything else. It's like, guys, you have to understand that everything, just because you want things and because you as a person, everybody's not going to line up what you think 100%. It's just not going to happen. That's not reality. When I go voting, not to make this a political thing, I never voted for a politician in my life that I agreed 100% with because I'm pragmatic. I go in that booth and I go, which one of these people will make the most sense to me that won't hurt me and my fellow countrymen, and I make the vote that way. I'm pragmatic. I vote not for just myself, but I vote for the people around me, hoping that other people will vote sensibly as I do. But I never go into a movie. I never go into a, uh, into the voting booth. I never go into like, well, this person or this thing has to be 100% what I believe. Otherwise, it's all bullshit and they're the enemy. I'm like, everybody needs to fucking relax. And if you don't like the movie, that's okay. There's 50 billion other movies you can enjoy. Move on. Yep. Um, I mean, for me, like, well, I mean, let's let's kind of get back to some, okay, of yeah. specific, some of the more specific issues, I guess. Yeah. Because uh, I'm having fun looking at the issues that people, <laughs> that people are having. So, okay, so we've covered the sort of Ray Palpatine thing, right? What about Kelly Marie Tran's character getting written out? That's, I'll say this. To me, I don't think there's, there, there's two, there, there, there's two, there's two theories you have. One makes 100% sense and one makes no sense. Consider, think about Disney. Disney is aware of, of, um, of, um, how people want more minorities in Star Wars and, 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 and Marvel movies. So they're working on that right there. You mean to tell me that they would go out of their way to take an Asian character out of the movie just to appease Five percent of whiny insult fanboys, just because of that. Or the other logic could be is is that for whatever reason the edit in the editing room, whatever her scenes were with Leia or whatever scenes she had on there, they had to mer- they had to cut that out because the movie had to flow a little better. I think to me when I watched that movie, I think there were there were two things that focused on anything didn't have to do with anything that had, didn't have to do with Ray or Kylo Ren had to go to make the movie run that way. Ray had Ray had to go from a straight line. To from her to Palpatine, and then the whole thing with Kylo Ren need to come to terms with him and um, and his evil and stuff like that. And then he goes along with Ray. Anybody who wasn't close to Ray kind of got pushed to the side in a sense right there. Now, now does that suck? Absolutely. If you're a Rose Tico fan and and, and the Force Awakens, I sympathize with you. But I got a theory. When I watched, I saw that movie a couple of times in the theater. And I don't think I've heard anybody in the hallway going, "Damn, man." There was enough Rose in that movie. I've yet to hear that outside of Twitter, right there. But I will say this to their effect: if you want to, if, if if Disney was, you talking about? And I said this on I put it on a Twitter thing. JJ was the same guy that got a Latino man, a black man, a woman to headline a Star Wars movie, which almost was never happened. The th- the leads were always white people to this point. And and if there's a woman who was who was in one of the third main one of the main characters, she was the second or the third main character. She wasn't the first main character. It's right there. Like, when I watch this movie, this is the most diverse I've ever seen a Star Wars movie. So, to me, does it suck that Kelly Marie Tran? And I always say this to people. I'm like, do you think that Disney's not going to give her a TV show at this point? Come on now, guys. At that point right there. 
So to me, so so for me, I understand the anger. I'm not gonna shit on somebody's anger if that's her, if they're their fan and they thought it sucked that she's having more time. But to me, I go along the lines of it just it just seemed like me as a film person looking at the edit, it seemed like everything that had didn't involve Ray going towards Palpatine because the movie was had to end in two and a half hours. They streamlined that shit. But that's just me. I mean, I'm pretty sure you might have a different opinion compared to me. No, I think it's just common sense. It's exactly what you're saying. If you're trying to wrap up, you know, the eight previous ones, right? You cannot have um, like everything from everyone from every film. You can't have it. You know what I mean? And and okay, you can have maybe cameos like Lando flies in and stuff. But Lando's a beloved part of of the first trilogy. I mean, especially like Return of the Jedi. But yes. Um, but basically, also. She had a lot of screen time in The Last Jedi. If you're talking about like relatively minor characters who have had a disproportionate amount of screen time compared to what their importance is to the film, yeah, or even, you know, the entire saga, she got a hell of a lot of screen time in The Last Jedi. Now, I know that came with a backlash and blah, 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 blah. And like maybe she would have had a bit more in this film, mm-hmm. but, but I don't think she would have had anything like the amount of screen time that she had in The Last Jedi. Because again, you're trying to, just like you're saying, it had to be streamlined. It had to fly through certain things. It had to get like the main characters, the actual stars of the thing to a certain point. And, I mean, the only slight criticism that I could see is that I, I read that JJ got his mate, what's his face? Um, from Lost. Yeah, from, uh, for Lord of the Rings, Dan McMahon. That's it, that's it. Yeah, he mm-hmm. got him in, and, and maybe that, that was some of the lines like could have been said by Rose or something like that. Okay, I kind of get that, but you're still yeah. basically talking about the odd line here or there. You're not talking about a major plot point. He, I also, he, 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 I could, yeah, oh, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I can also see how it would be frustrating if you've really fallen in love with The Last Jedi and seen how, you know, the sort of Finn and Rose kind of dynamic and, and they build so much of it in that film to suddenly have none of it, right? Then that I can see how you'd be like, okay, that makes no sense, right? Why are they just suddenly all off? But but the problem is, is that if this really is the end of this saga, of this nine installment saga, then you have to make choices. You know, you, it, it's not kind of like, you cannot fit everything into a four hour film. It's just yes. not realistic. Here's the thing. You're ending the Skywalker saga. Star Wars is not done. Those characters will go on. This had the job of rapping nine movies over 40 years. I mean, the the Avengers thing is more complicated, but but this one, like, you had to end, the thing had to be about the Skywalker legacy. The whole entire point of the nine films is, what was the, does, like I said, this framed the last three movies, and what was the legacy of Anakin and his children? What was, the leg- what was their legacy? And what did they inspire in this next generation? And that's pretty much what this trilogy was about. Like, this is the generation that grew up after the Skywalkers. And Rey specifically got trained by both Luke and Leia right there. So why would she not consider herself a Skywalker? Why would she not think that's the, a path that's better to follow than the Palpatine right there? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's interesting. Like I said, I'm pretty sure with, with going on later on in the future, you'll see, Rose T- you'll see her again. That's not the end of these characters. These characters will go on. And with the Disney and with the, and with the Mandalorian and stuff like that, there's endless amounts of time to tell stories with these people right there. I guarantee you there's going to be a Rose Tico show being announced next year. I guarantee you. Not even a question. And if she's not the main character, she's a part of an ensemble or something like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's talk about our beloved Adam Driver. So we, we <clears throat> write a lyrical about him in uh, Marriage Story. <clears throat> and uh, here we go. He comes back as Kylo Ren, stroke Ben Solo. What did you make of his, uh, well, I mean, the actual character, but also his own performance? I, like I said, he hasn't missed yet this year. And, and I would say it's weird because it's almost the same thing with Marriage Story where where his actresses, who he co-starred with, they, they at, as, as much as he brings the best out of them, they bring the best out of him too. Because Daisy Ridley, like, to me, I, I know Adam Driver is, is an excellent actor, but for me personally, watching all three movies, because Adam Driver is more that is, is the more hot guy to minute. I think compared to um, uh, Mark Hamill and Hayden Christensen and by extension Jake Lloyd, I think um, uh, Daisy Ridley might be the most consistent main character as far as performance going on in Star Wars. Like I love Mark Hamill stuff like that, and he's gotten better over the years and this and that. But I think she, I, I think that she and Adam Driver are probably the most consistent actors in Star Wars history. 
if, if, if you're looking at fully from acting performance right there and like and like being consistent and never missing the beat, you could kind of argue maybe you and McGregor. Ian McDermott. Ian McDermott is like in a class by himself. You can't compare. The Emperor is like in a category. You can't. <laughs> I'm talking about. The Emperor is one of the greatest villains of all time. That's not even in the same category, man. I can't even talk about that. Okay. He's that good. You go without saying. So I, that's not even should be acknowledged. That's just Ian McDermott. Like anytime, anytime the Emperor is on screen, whether he's not burnt or not. Either, either, whether he's burnt by lightning or did not, like this. Okay, we'll talk about the emperor in a moment because he said one, <laughs> he, he, one of my favorite. He's one of my, all. I, I I get giddy with the emperor. So anyway, no, I think he was. I think he was fantastic. Like when he went, the thing, the thing that the last. If 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 somebody were to watch the last Jedi and then watch this movie directly after that, because I watched the last Jedi again, and I'm like, when people are like, where did that kiss come from? If you watch the last Jedi, you can see where. Where the compassion and the attraction comes from, because somebody made a, I was I was talking to somebody on Twitter. Somebody made a good point. Kylo Ren never wants to kill her. He wants her to be by his side. He never wants to kill her. At the point he he's so lonely that he need he wants somebody by his side. And in some and in some way they got the connection of he comes from darkness and he went into darkness and he needs somebody to relate to her. And there, and there's a line in this movie and there's a line in Ryan Skywalker. He was like, "Well, I can't go back to my mom." He said, "After what I did to my dad, I can't go back to my mom." After that. And he thinks he's gone. And she's kind of like, and it goes back to that cycle in Star Wars where Padme, even her dying breath, she still felt there was good in Anakin. Where Luke, he, he still felt there was good in his dad. And then now Rey thinks there's still good in the heroes. Of, there's the heroes of the stories where they go like, you know what? There's this darkness, but I believe in my heart of hearts that there's good and there's always a chance that these people can come back. And I think that's what helped him get through there. Like she healed him right after he, he was going to, in his final act, he was really going to kill her, and she still wound up healing him. He was like, "Jesus Christ! Like, damn! I need to, I fucked up. I need to get my act together." It's kind of stuff like that. But going back to this one, it's not as he's not as comp, it's not as complicated as his character in um, in Marriage Story because it can't be because he plays a human being in Marriage Story. He's playing an archetype in um, in in um, the the rise of Jedi, the rise of Skywalker. But I think like Marriage Story, his his co star brings out the best in him, and I just think for me the M- the MVP besides, of course, me and McDermott. Um, to me, I'm much more impressed with Daisy Ridley than I am with um, Adam Driver. But he's a very right. He's right behind her for me. Yeah, I, I think she just does a really good job all the way through. She never drops below like a, a seven out of ten. Basically, she doesn't even have any moments where I'd argue that she drops below yeah. that kind of thing. Um, Whereas, obviously, I think you just talk about different eras, really. And, and under George Lucas, he was the kind of director which is just like, okay, here are the lines, get on with it. You know, there's no direction of the actual actors, really. Because his philosophy, yeah, because his philosophy was, I'm paying you millions of dollars. Yeah. They're not complicated characters. Let's do it. And actors are more like, we're all feely and touchy. Like, give us a moment to feel stuff like that. But there's some aspects of George I get, but I understand actors, so... You could tell that J.J. and Ryan are better directors of actors than George Lucas was. George Lucas is a fantastic storyteller. He has vision. I think that his vision is so far ahead that sometimes his sometimes um, the people around him get frustrated because they're more of traditional artisans. And he's more along the lines of like, I know what I want, guys. I'm paying you to do my vision. I don't need all this other crap. <laughs> but... But he he's not an actor director. I will admit that he by by any side of he's a he's a great visionary. He's done incredible things for cinema as far as technologically and story wise. But you could clearly tell that the acting across the board in the, in the if there's one thing I can say about the sequel trilogy, the acting across the board is uniformly excellent, and consistent yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it, it, but but also I'd say that it's just of its era because yes. you couldn't you couldn't get away with what like the prequels did acting wise <laughs> and stuff like that. And we love the prequels, but yes, you, yes. Know, you, you couldn't get away with it now. Like what yeah. what George Lucas needed, like if you kind of take the sports analogy, is he, he's a genius manager at like strategizing about building a squad, about doing all these kind of huge things. But he's not like a man motivator. He's not the one who will eke out individual performances like from those particular players yes. what he needed was a number two next to him to do that shit for him because that was yes. a clear weakness and mm. and you know it's it's kind of a shame because then then maybe that would have kind of like redefined especially the prequels i think because yes. you know like at least with star wars that's coming off the 70s era which was such a strong era you couldn't i don't think you could have fucked up too much kind of thing whereas i think the prequels was just a whole different can of worms 
even when I was watching, I was watching the Phantom Menace. I haven't had time to watch all the Star Wars films recently. I really wanted to after watching yeah. the Rise of Sky- Skywalker, but I watched Phantom Menace and I was like, uh, you know, Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor, they still do their shit, man. I mean, you know, there's, uh, we have talked about this on podcasts, um, like go right to the, back to the beginning of our timeline, but you know, they, they give perfectly good performance. And Airy Dermot, yeah, the Aunt Airy Dermot. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, okay, <laughs> you, you, you can, you can talk about him now. I set you up. You can, you can go for it. No, go ahead. I'm going to finish. Why don't you finish your start? Oh, okay. Um, but but I think what I find fascinating about Rise of Skywalker is it's kind of like this really tightly interwoven tapestry with all these kind of things from the past, which is brought to the present kind of thing. But yeah, and it's kind of like I think I, I've only watched it once, but I can imagine watching it again and again and picking up on something else and something I else did. and something else. Exactly. And this is this is why it's so good that we're doing this podcast like a couple of weeks later. Because I don't know, have you been re- re-watching all the old films as well? I've been re-watching the sequel. I watched the old one so many times I don't need to watch them anymore. Yeah. But I've been watching the, the, the sequel trilogy just to see how, like, I, I really do believe at the end of the day that looking at the sequel, looking at Force Awakens, Right, I know uh, JJ was going towards the Emperor. He was going that route. I really do believe that at the end of the day. There are certain things when you look at the um, the Force Awakens. I think Ryan Johnson tried to do the subversion thing. And I'm like, I get that part right there. I'm like, and I tell people, like, well, Ray is Ray. Ray is nobody. I'm like, but I don't think Ray would stop searching first for her family history just because somebody told her parents were nobodies. I don't think that the girl who was a scavenger all her life waiting for her parents to come back would go, you know what? I'm nobody. Life moves on. Let's move on. I think she would still keep going because she still kept the Jedi books. And so JJ was like, you know what? I can build back and bring it back around to how it originally was going to end the movie, right? It was really the end of the trilogy. I thought it, I mean, I thought it all fit because people say, well, it wasn't planned all the way. I'm like, George had an outline and he changed things as they needed to be from movie to movie. It's not like George had this, this, this out, this, this strict rules. Like I, you can't deviate from this. He had, a, he had an ideal, he had an outline, and he deviated when needed because when you're making films, you have to be able to deviate from certain things because the reality of the situation. Sometimes things don't work out the way you work out on set, and you got to change that. Sometimes scenes don't work. That you had, Sometimes when you put something on paper, it looks like a good idea. You put it on screen, and you do the edit, it's like, nah, it's not going to work. You have, what the first rule of editing is, you have to kill any ideal, even if it's good, that, does, that hurts the movie. Yep. And I mean, coming back to that kind of tapestry element, I mean, you know, you kind of sit there and think back on this film. I haven't watched it again, but you have, you know, Han Solo fucking turns up in this film telling Ben to, you know, what you were saying before about, oh, I still think there's good in him. I said, blah, blah. He said that in Force Awakens. Yeah. And right before, <laughs> before he leaves to go and get killed by his son. You want something funny? You know what? You want something funny? The lines that he says to him in, in the Rise of Skywalker is the exact same words he said to him in the Force Awakens. Obviously, it, and of course, yes, it is. And, yes, and that's the whole. It, that's what I'm trying to say. People don't get that. People, yeah, people, people don't, don't get that. that. You know, and and like he comes back again in this to sort of help, you know, cure, like crystallize the moment for everyone that okay, he's turning back into Ben Solo now. Yeah, you know, even when you were saying that um, that Ray heals him, I don't know if you noticed, but the scar on his face heals as well right mm-hmm. so so it's that obvious a manifestation okay he's now the good guy and and actually in terms of because i'm just thinking back to things you were saying before about like people shipping ray and um and kylo ren yeah or or not shipping them in last jedi the whole kind of like i remember we talked about it on the podcast like when it looks like they're facetiming each other kind of thing right when they're just doing yeah. this whole you know mind connection blah 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 thing I remember that scene when he's shirtless and how uncomfortable she feels. And then she's like, put a shirt on. But the sexual chemistry is clearly there. Yeah, like absolutely. So it, it was planted there just in case that's yes. the way they want to go. Yeah. Because yeah, there's always, you know, I mean, you had it in um, Ding Dong. What do you call it? The, the original trilogy between Luke and Leia and Han. Right? Yes. Now, okay, well, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, you're like, it's clearly going to go this way. Yeah. But actually, at the time, I'm sure people were like, they didn't know exactly. You've got to keep that tension. Yes. And here, there is the tension between Ray and Finn and, you know, Kylo Ren, basically. Yes. I mean, it, it is there, yeah. And so it's not people just imagining it. And, and okay, oh my God. Can I get back to things that I hate about okay. film Twitter? So okay. the whole thing... So, just real quick, real quick. I better wrap it up soon because I really go. Okay, okay. So, so, so the thing, the kind of things that I really hate are when people were shipping... Finn and uh, what's his face, Oscar Isaac's character, uh, yeah. things like that. 
I just I, I just hate it because I also think it's really patronizing to the gay community as well. I, yes. I just it's kind of like, you know, things have to happen how they happen. You, you cannot force everything, and and like it's ridiculous, you know, and. And then, okay, they put in a lesbian kiss at the end, and then people are like, oh my god, I can't believe they were just in the background and it was only two seconds. It's a fucking Star Wars film, guys. Come on, guys. I mean, do you see a tweet? Do you see a tweet I had the other day? I was like, first of all, as a grown adult, why do you give a fuck about Star Wars character sex lives? That's number one. I was like, if you want to see that, I was like, I put down, I was like, if you want to see that shit, go watch an R rated movie or watch a porno. How about that? But I also wanted to say, I'm like, I also want to say, like, there's also some practice, I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to hold back gay representation or the LGBTQ representation. I'm all for that. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, but also there are parts of the country that are still editing stuff like that out in their theaters, like China and Singapore and stuff like that. There's still culture. There's still cultures. There's still cultures that still can't handle interracial relationships. Are crying out loud. Jesus Christ. So yeah, I'm just saying for for Star Wars. Get, Star Wars will get there. I think once this, once I think once they get the Skywalker saga out of the system, which they did, they can start lower like lower budget movies, and they can afford to have more representation in these movies. I think a lot of this is when you invest like hundreds of millions of dollars in these movies. There's there's a lot more risk of failure. All that money to recoup back. And I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm not saying like you should hold you should hold um that stuff right there. I was like, but I also want to say I was like because people are like, well, Disney should um should um should uh should uh, rebel against China until they accept that more often. I'm like, if you really want to go to that dark place, then maybe Disney shouldn't support America because we still got kids in cages right now. Yep. So if you want to take the moral high ground, if you want to tell Disney to stop dealing with China and dealing with Singapore about gay rights, then maybe Disney should stop dealing with us until we get kids out of cages. Just a thought there. Yeah. And, and as we talked about in the trilogy, uh, the prequel podcast that we did, um, I will, we'll wrap it up in the next couple of minutes, but like, like you know, the whole thing is like people are always oh, about taxation and trade routes, blah blah blah. It's boring. It's no, boring. it was about fucking rise and fall of Hitler, man. It was yes. about Nixon. It was about Vietnam. It was about all these things, and that's what it was really about. In, First in of all, did yeah, did, did 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 Lucas pull out a tax a tax bill and say let's let's get the tax bill? <laughs> It's like he said, the, the the argument was sort of over a tax with a tax route, and he's that's all he used it for. It's like that's the reason why the trade the trade federation blockaded this thing. The whole entire point of the trade blockation was wasn't about the was about the taxes. It was about it was about Palpatine putting himself in position to take over as chancellor. That's what the whole entire thing was about. It's not. It wasn't about that at all. Okay, well, I mean, I tell you what, let's start to wrap it up now because mm-hmm. um, I, I, th- I feel like we've kind of only sort of touched the surface of this film and maybe we'll come kind of back. Uh, we do a Skywalker back. saga discussion or something like that? Yeah, maybe. I think maybe we'll kind of sort of wrap them all up together and, and sort of then we can get into the more interwoven elements of it because it's really difficult. There's so much in this film. I mean, just but just generally, I really liked it. I, I enjoyed it. I came out with a high and then I've kept thinking about it afterwards and sort of and through the help of Twitter, the, the good side of Twitter, where where you kind of like, oh yeah, I didn't realize this moment was linked back to this and all this kind of stuff. So, I've I've enjoyed just rediscovering it on on that side of things. Um, yeah. So yeah. So what were your kind of final thoughts on the film? I'm I'm impressed that for all my criticism of, of Disney as a corporation, like I said, there, there, there's a gift and a curse of corporations. It's like um, I can't even the anti capitalist on Twitter is doing that crap because we're all capitalists. Be honest with you, so. If you, unless you're Harry David Thoreau and you decide to go into the forest and build a log cabin and detach from society, you're still a part of the system. So let's just stop right there. But um, I'm impressed for me, even though I think Endgame's ending was the greater achievement as ending a saga, because that was just Infinity War and Endgame at a whole nother level ended the saga. But I think to me, I think JJ did, JJ and Disney and Kathleen Kennedy did the, the best job they possibly could wrangling in the Skywalker saga. And looking at the um, looking at the box office, I think most people do enjoy it. Twitter aside, and I think that once we get away from once there's some distance from all this stuff right there, I think people who aren't as heated and then want certain things from this and that right there, I think they'll appreciate watching all three of them back to back to back because I think that the theme of these three movies wind up being identity and legacy. I think that's the two themes that tie all these three movies together, and then that whole idea of identity and legacy. It's kind of like I I put on I have a tweet where it's kind of like um the first three the first three movies are episodes one and three are the tragedy of the House of Skywalker 
the episodes four through six are the redemption of the house of skywalker and episodes seven through nine are the legacy of the house of skywalker and i think if you think of those nine movies that way thematically it works now there are there things that kind of like don't work and do work yeah of course that's, that's any film saga even even the even the MCU has that stuff like that. Even the greatest of sagas have stuff like that. Because we're humans and there's reality and there's practicalities and humans aren't perfect. But my personal philosophy on the Rise of Skywalker is, is that they ended this nine film saga the best they could with the best they can. And that's a miracle in itself. Yeah, I'm not going to add anything to that. I think that was a great, great summation, basically. Um, but... Yeah, don't forget to check us out because we're sorry, we're just rushing against the clock. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook at Transatlantic Rebels Podcast and on Twitter at T underscore Rebels. And uh, yeah, we will definitely try to get back into a kind of retrospective of these three films, the, the most recent three Star Wars films. So um, thank you very much for myself and from Rashad, and we will catch you next time. Peace.